is because of your faithfulness, your great faithfulness that we can gather and worship and sing. Lord, because you have saved us, you have forgiven our sins because of what Christ accomplished on the cross, because of what he accomplished in his life and providing righteousness for us and his resurrection and providing eternal life for us, Lord, that we can come and sing and celebrate our union with you. Lord, we pray for those who are not unified to Christ, that they would understand the gospel, they would believe it and build their lives on it. Thus be saved today. Lord, give them the faith and repentance they need to follow after Christ and become a genuine believer. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Well, it is a true blessing to be with you again. Let's open our Bibles to Matthew 21. In Matthew 21, we count it, as always, our supreme joy to gather and study the Bible together. So, so thankful to God for this great privilege. After the triumphal entry, those early verses in Matthew 21, Jesus' authority and rule is applied. What is His attitude toward the false religion of the day? Hebrew religion, Judaism of that day, had drifted away from biblical truth. It had drifted both to liberalism and legalism. Worse than either, though, it had altogether abandoned the hope of the true biblical Messiah and replaced the idea of the biblical Messiah with their own ideas of what they wanted in a Messiah. And so we've noted as we've gone through Matthew's gospel, there are these sporadic meetings of Jesus and the religious leaders of that day, and Jesus sort of lightly confronts them here and there throughout His ministry. Why? Because that Judaism, no matter how similar it was to biblical truth, had turned, it had soured and turned into a false religion. This, of course, is in violation of God's moral will, but it was all part of God's sovereign will. It was all part of His plan to put Jesus on the cross by Passover. So Jesus had set His face like flint toward Jerusalem. He had set His face like flint toward the cross. He had come into Jerusalem the week of Passover, first to pronounce, pronounce judgment upon the false religion, and then to die, to be executed by those people promulgating that false religion, all a part of the beautiful plan of God. So Jesus is setting this all up. He's planning, in essence, He's planning His own execution by coming in, announcing the folly of this false religion. And today He points to the, this folly of false religion by a miraculous demonstration. By the way, this is His only miracle of destruction. All the miracles we see of Jesus are that of creation, that of, of rejuvenation, revival, you could say. This is His only miracle of destruction. Here, this is demonstrated in His power to judge, His power to curse, His power to bring death as the ultimate judge assigned by God. For believers, we're going to discover today that the truth of Jesus is judge. It should inspire us to hope. It should encourage us that one day everything will be made right. Everything will be brought to justice. Ultimately, this should lead us to greater faith in Him. That's what we heard from 1 Thessalonians 5 a moment ago. Jesus, for us, is not coming to us as a thief in the night. When Jesus returns, it'll be a great joy for us. It's something we're anticipating. It's something we're look for, looking forward to. It's something that we are, are preparing ourselves for. It's not some sort of surprise, deadly attack as it is for the lost. He comes as a fulfillment of all, all of our desires. So we ought to encourage one another, as it says, to hope in Christ for that day, to grow in our faith in Christ, finding all our desires fulfilled in Him. For unbelievers, for hypocrites truth of Jesus as judge should spark in your heart a trembling, a terrifying reality, and He'll come not to relieve you, not as your hope, but as a horrible, shocking surprise, a shocking, sudden judgment that will leave you eternally apart from God. Well, you'll hear this theme in our text today, so let's read together. Follow along as I read aloud. I'm reading in Matthew 21. It's the story of the cursing of the fig tree, beginning at verse 18. I'll go down to verse 22. Follow along as I read aloud. In the morning, 
As he was returning to the city, he became hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the wayside, he went to it and found nothing on it but only leaves. And he said to it, May no fruit ever come from you again. And the fig tree withered at once. When the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How did the fig tree wither at once? Jesus answered them, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, Be taken up and thrown to the sea, into the sea, it will happen. Whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. This is the Word of God. Martin Luther made one single trip to the Vatican, to Rome. It was long before he was saved, long before the Protestant Reformation. Of that trip, Luther said, quote, I left with onions and came back with garlic. Now, why would he say that and what in the world does it mean? Well, he was a young priest, and at that point he had begun uh, to grow a little bit disenchanted with the Catholic Church, not in a theological way. In fact, it would be some years before he began to really dig and, and look at the, the doctrine and, and theology of the Catholic Church and compare it to Scripture, but, but he was beginning to grow disenchanted with what was happening, especially sort of in a, in, a, in a local priest sense, in sort of a parochial sense, as he looked around at the priests and what was happening in the churches around him. It really bothered him, and he thought, well, this is a great opportunity because I can go to that holy city, and as I grow closer, it'll get better and better, and I will go to that holy city and, and see, and all my, my hopes and dreams will be realized as I uh, see things happening in Rome and the priest and even the pope himself, what's happening there. It'll just encourage me. Again, he was discouraged in that day. He was looking around and saw all these different priests. He saw them engaging in what's called simony. Simony is the purchasing of office. He saw the, basically these leaders, men, who were not qualified as priests, who were not trained as priests, but because being a priest, there was some kind of power, political power even. He, he saw people purchasing the position as priests. Can you imagine if that were happening even today, if political leaders were buying pulpits and becoming preachers, not based on their qualifications, but just to gain power and authority over people. He saw this happening. He saw people, he, like he would later on, he would see Johann Tetzel selling all these indulgences. This, this man was little more than a really bad used car salesman, pawning off these things to people, had all kinds of wickedness about him. In fact, it was said of Johann Tetzel that he would sometimes bring his illegitimate children with him. He had a number of mistresses with whom he had had children, and they would come around with him and, and travel with him as he sold these indulgences. So again, Luther was becoming disenchanted with what was happening on that sort of local level and thought, you know, this may solve my problem. If I go to Rome and I see the glories of the Holy City and get around, at least around where the Pope is, maybe, maybe this will encourage in me a, a, a heart of, of genuine revival. Maybe I'll be revived in my love for the Catholic Church. Well, not only did that not turn out like that, what he discovered is that the closer he got to Rome, the more corrupt he saw in the priesthood. As he closed in on Rome, they got worse. By and large, the priests were more corrupt, more filthy mouthed. They were scoundrels. They celebrated drunkenness. They celebrated debauchery. They even mocked at one point. He, he heard them mocking the practice of, of Eucharist. So by saying, I left with onions and came back with garlic, Luther was saying in his trip, nothing changed. I thought I was going to be encouraged. I thought I would come back with something beautiful, something encouraging, but nothing changed. It was corrupt, as corrupt as he saw in Wittenberg, if not worse. And the most troubling part about it for him was the hypocrisy. The priests were to be the most sincere, the most devout, those with the greatest level of love and integrity and virtue, the greatest ethics, yet they were the worst. And they used their position in that religion to levy heavy burdens upon the people, to take their money, to line their own pockets, to live lives of utter selfishness. Now, the Bible is not silent about this brand of hypocrisy among spiritual leaders. That's why it says in James 3, verse 1, "...not many of you should become teachers, my brothers." For, uh, for you that those who teach will be judged with greater strictness. That, that theme basically tells us there is indeed a literal hotter place in hell 
for people who are hypocrites of that sort, who are teaching and yet live these secret lives of debauchery. Jesus quoted from Isaiah in talking about the religious leaders. We saw this back in Matthew 15. The people honored me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. What we have here in the middle of Matthew 21 is a living parable, Jesus' attitude toward the false religion of Israel in that day. Jesus' cursing of the fig tree is a picture of His authority to judge that false religion and judge the hypocritical religious leaders of that day. And by extension, everybody who was involved in a whole corrupt system. He had come to serve. He had come to save. He had come to offer His life as a ransom for many. And the very people who should have welcomed him and worshipped him the most were the ones who sought his death. Now, because of that hypocrisy, they were destined for greater judgment from Jesus. And that's what we see in the cursing of the fig tree. The first first lesson that we learn then is, number one, you write this down, hypocrites be warned. Hypocrites be warned. Now, there's a couple of details here I need to explain because... Inquisitive minds will ask. The verse has to do with the chronology of Matthew's account of the cursing of the fig tree. There's only one other place that this story is recorded. It's in the book of Mark. And if you read Matthew uh, account, Matthew's account of the cursing of the fig tree and Mark's account of the fig tree, it sounds a little bit different. And the main difference may be in the chronology of that parallel story. I won't read it for you, it's quite a bit longer, but basically the way Mark presents the story is that on the morning that Jesus went in and cleansed the temple, which we studied last time, they're headed to the temple mount and Jesus cursed the fig tree there before He went up and cleansed the temple. Goes to the temple, does His thing, heals the people, teaches, goes back that night, spends the night in Bethany, and it's the next morning, according to Mark, that they came by and saw that the fig tree had withered. And there's some discussion there about what this means. Here in Matthew, you'll notice, we just read it, there's no hint of happening it, it happening in two different days. Rather, Matthew simply tells us that Jesus, after the day He went up and cleansed the temple, they get up the next morning, they come back, and He cursed the fig tree, and at once they saw the effects and had a discussion. He even says that it withered at once. Well, how do we reconcile these two stories? Well, for one thing, linguistically... There is room in Matthew's account for it it to have occurred exactly the way that Mark said in a little more detailed way. In other words, there's enough flexibility in the language, in the Greek language that we read in both the accounts, uh, to say something like, Jesus cursed, cursed the fig tree and they saw it immediately begin to wither. It didn't have to wither completely. It didn't just turn to dust as they saw this, but they immediately saw the effects. They went into the temple. They came back the next day, the next morning, and saw that it was much more withered or perhaps even dead at that point. It doesn't specify whether it withered all the time, all the way, or whether it just began to wither. Then Matthew does something that he's been doing all along. If you compare Matthew's, uh, this section of Matthew to what's happening in Mark, what you find is that, is that Matthew and Mark, Matthew tends to be a lot more abbreviated. He sort of shortens every account into a sor- sort of a summary paragraph. Instead of uh, uh, 15 verses or 17 verses, he uses like six verses to talk about the same different accounts that were happening here. And Mark seems to be a little more specific and take these stories in a little bit more detailed format. So Matthew's just compressing this. He's abbreviating, giving us the summary story. Nothing changes about the meaning. Nothing changes about the miracle. Nothing changes about what Jesus is doing or saying. Nothing changes at all. It's just a little bit more abbreviated summary of what happened. And there's no conflict with either account. All right, now you guys can wake back up. There's another thing that people do bring up in the cursing of the fig tree. They read this story and they say, boy, Jesus sort of sounds sort of petulant. By petulant, I mean shallow, angry, irritable, frustrated, petty. In fact, somebody, and this is some years ago, he's not a part of our church anymore, but somebody who was a member of our church said, you know, there's a lot that Jesus does in the Bible. I tell my kids, don't act like Jesus here. Jesus was really being bad right here. And this is one of the things he told me. You know, he just seems so petulant and petty. He wants something to eat. There's no food there. And he just gets mad and uses his power to to curse this big tree. Now, how do we 
answer something like that. That doesn't sound like a Jesus that we want to serve if that's what was happening. Well, again, a little bit of context will go a long way. In that day, the fig industry was the lifeblood of many people in that era, as it is today, actually. Made up a huge part of their economy and their food, their resources, their diet even. And just as there are, there are today, back then, there were a number of different uh, varieties of fig trees. The one that was farmed, the one that would be sort of producing figs on a regular basis, on a predictable way, this is the one that they would have used in, in farming and agricultural and, and agriculture, and it would be something that would produce fruit every fall, like all the other plants. There were other fig trees, more or less the wild fig trees, that you really didn't know. They were unpredictable, and they would produce it at different times during the year, and they wouldn't know exactly when to expect it. But the way they would know a fig tree, a particularly wild fig tree, they would know that it was producing fruit is that it would have leaves on it. This helps us also understand why Jesus is. He's not just walking onto someone's fig tree farm. They call it an orchard. I don't know what they call a fig farm. Go on a fig farm and just start yanking fruit off someone else's tree. No, this is a, a wild fig tree. And it had all the leaves from, from a distance, and as they got closer and closer, it looked like, oh, it's full of leaves. It should have fruit. Sort of like mango trees, as the blossoms start to come out, you know there's fruit on it. And Jesus sees the, the, the healthy amount of leaves. He walks up to it. As they get closer and closer, it looks more and more really like it's going to be producing all kinds of fruit. He gets up, and there's nothing. There are many leaves, but no fruit. Well, this helps us understand the living principle, right? There was an illusion there's the promise of fruit. You look at that tree far away, even as you get closer and closer, there's promise of fulfillment, there's promise of food, there's promise of sustenance until you get right up and start poking around. Then you discover this tree is worthless. Had all the promise, had the illusion of fulfillment of food, but it produces absolutely nothing. The word hypocrisy, Jesus actually uses this, uses this all throughout the scripture to talk about the leaders of the religion of the day, the hypocrites of the day. That word hypocrite or hypocrisy, originally from the literal Greek phrase, one who wears a mask, it meant uh, for some time there simply actor. It was the word that they used for actors, people who would put on mask, literal mask, and act. By the time that Jesus used the word, it was a talk about a certain, a certain type of sin and sinner. What is that sin? The sin is hypocrisy. The people who commit that sin are hypocrites. Hypocrisy is the act of professing a level of morality, a level of sincerity, perhaps even a level of devotion to religious principles, while at the same time, either inside their heart or maybe just behind closed doors or a different place when no one's watching, that person is the opposite. Sometimes hypocrisy is taken a step further. The, the hypocrite not only professes to be religious, they condemn others publicly for living in certain ways that they themselves engage in when no one's watching. Now, I want to make this clear. Hypocrisy is not simply being imperfect. That's all of us. It's not simply saying, I follow Christ, but following Christ imperfectly. That's true of everyone. No, rather it is an, a deliberate, decisive, intentional act of deception. It, it, it is a lie. And it, and it comes from none other than Satan who is the father of what? Lies. It, it is trying to be something and seem something to people, though you know you're not that. It is a deliberate, intentional act of deception. If you're a hypocrite, you're not just someone who struggles with sin and asking for help and authentically seeking some sort of accountability. No, you hide the sin, the very sin that you publicly disdain. It is a sin in of itself, but it includes some, somewhat like the sin of adultery or something like that. It includes layers of other sins, lying and deception and uh, self-deception. It includes layers of other sin. And like I said, this is the M.O., the modus operandi of none other than Satan himself. It's all about deception. Now, I want to digress for a moment because of the age we're in. This, 
understanding of hypocrisy that I've just talked about is entirely corrupted in our day to day. If you go back through the history of thought, if you study philosophy, you'll find out that some years ago, thinkers like Rousseau and Hegel and Marx and Nietzsche, even Freud, they laid the groundwork for what we see in society today when people talk about authenticity and hypocrisy. In our society today, to be authentic, the authentic person is the person, a uh, person who's not a hypocrite, is the person who lives out all of their impulses. Whatever sinful, carnal desire, you are encouraged to be authentic, not a hypocrite. It's to live out those sinful and carnal desires. Authenticity, they say, is espousing and executing any desire, any impulse that you may have in your wicked heart. The authentic person, they tell us, is the person who embraces all your impulses as your identity. And to deny yourself the expression of your impulses is to be in, inauthentic and to be a hypocrite. And so they fight. They fight in the public arena. They fight in government. They say all people should be allowed and free to express, express whatever impulse, no matter how deviant or sinful. Self-expression, this is the highest, highest ethic the pinnacle of morality, all other things are below that. This is why, for instance, abortion is so widely accepted. Tearing a, a prenatal baby limb from limb from somebody's womb may not be a good thing, but for them, because self-expression is the most important ethic, you have to live up. You have to be true to yourself. You're not a parent. Get rid of that baby. If that's what you want, you want the desire of free sex, a, a life without children, then... That's what you have to live up to, even if it means the death of a child. If that's what you want, if that's your impulse, then to be authentic, you have to carry this out, as society tells us. What's the phrase we hear all the time? I mentioned it. Be true to yourself more colloquially. Something that's come around lately is, you be you, right? This is the highest and most important morality in our society today. Well, one, one way to see the utter stupidity of that kind of mentality, of that philosophy, is just to say that phrase, you be you, and just put someone's, some horrible person's name on the end of it. You be you, Jeffrey Dahmer. Hey, man, you want to eat people? You be you. You be you, Hitler. Makes no sense. There has to be an outside objective standard of truth to which we live up to. But they look at Christians... And they see us trying to crucify the flesh. They see us trying to flee our immorality, trying to, to kill those wicked impulses. And they say, oh, you're all hypocrites. And we say, no, we're just trying to live up to what Christ calls us. Again, people look at Christians who make it a habit to crucify the old man, to war against the sinful impulses of our flesh. They look at us... And from a demented, corrupted perspective, they say we're all hypocrites. We're all inauthentic. Well, I've digressed a little bit. I'm reading a book right now, so you get a little piece of it. <laughs> My point is to narrow down what Jesus means when he's giving this illustration of the fig tree. These are real hypocrites. These are people who are intentionally deceitful. They're not just people who are trying to live righteous. These are people who are intentionally deceitful. They teach one thing, and they deny it with their lives. And Jesus, every time He comes in contact, or almost every time He comes in contact, He doesn't hesitate to use that word, hypocrites. You hypocrites. It's not some ridiculous notion of self-expression being muted. It's these people were proclaiming to obey God and to live under God's rule, and yet they denied God with their lives. They profess knowledge of the Bible. As Jesus showed over and over, have you not read? Have you not read? They have no real knowledge of the Bible. They professed a thoroughgoing morality and ethics, and yet we see them demonstrate time and time again they have hatred, spite, callousness. They professed they were awaiting the Messiah, and yet when the Messiah actually came, they killed him. They are the poster children for the sin of hypocrisy. So this is my encouragement. If you're just struggling with sin and you're open about it, trying to live up to the standard that God has, yes, you must be aware of the lurking sin of hypocrisy. That sin will be a temptation for all of us. 
But this warning is not mostly for you. This warning is for the real hypocrites. I have no doubt. Some of you are in this very room. We will proclaim your righteousness. You pretend and you put on a really good show, but down lurking deep inside, you're a hypocrite. You know it. And this is a great warning for you. At any moment, Jesus could curse you and you die. Matthew places the emphasis on the immediacy of the curse. Immediately it withered. Like I said, doesn't mean it turned to dust immediately, but as soon as Jesus, the judge, said the word, there was no more hope for that hypocritical bush. Just like the leaders he was confronting, he pronounced the curse and it was over. No more hope. Friend, take a warning from this story. Your days are numbered. The only way free from that damning sin of hypocrisy is to have faith in Christ, to open up, to confess your sin. The Bible says in Proverbs 28, 13, that the person who hides his sin will not prosper, that the person who confesses his sin will obtain mercy. In other words, if you cover your sin in the judgment, you will be uncovered. But if you uncover your sin and confess it before God, in the judgment, you'll be covered. That's the point. Hypocrites be warned. This is the point. This illustration that Jesus was giving is that the hypocrisy of that false religion would be exposed and judged. It was under a curse. And Jesus had the power and the right to judge hypocrites, and He did. Number two, believers be encouraged. Believers be encouraged. Just as hypocrites ought to fear Jesus the judge, we Believers are encouraged by the fact that Jesus has that power and authority. When the disciples saw this, this is verse 20, when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How did the fig tree wither at once? And Jesus answered them, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to this fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown to the sea, it will happen. Whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. Now, it's pretty easy to see here that Jesus is encouraging them. He's not damning them. He's not cursing them. He's encouraging them. So in the face of this curse against the hypocrisy of the false religion, He's encouraging the believers. He's, this is His response to that curse. He's encouraging the believers. So it's easy to see that this is an encouragement. But what is this encouragement? And what, what is He saying exactly? Is He saying, you know, if you want a Mercedes, just ask for it. I'll give it to you. You want a better job? Just ask for it. You want a better spouse? Just say the word. I'll give it to you. Is that what he's saying? He talks about... <laughs> Way to go. Somebody's listening. <laughs> it's not what he's saying at all. Way to go. You know, we just, I just want to say this. We decided uh, as we came out of the COVID stuff... We couldn't get enough volunteers to just fully, fully do our children's church. And I think it goes to, I don't know, age five or four or something like that. It goes to that. And we actually have grown to like it. I know sometimes there's noise and stuff. We kind of grow to, we've grown to like this. We like having all the kids here. So uh, thank you, young man, for that. Way to go. His grandpa is a preacher, so he knows what to say. No, this does not mean we can ask for whatever we want of God. It doesn't mean we can just take our, again, our sinful impulses and bring them to God and say, hey, I want this, I want that. Fulfill my greedy desires. What does that mean here? Well, we've got to look at the context here. Let's remember that Jesus had said something just like this earlier to the disciples. Keep your finger there in 21 and flip back to Matthew 17. The idea of faith moving mountains. Jesus had mentioned this to His disciples already and Whatever he says here, it's in context, right? It, it gives them context to what happens. What's that saying? A text without context is pretext. Boy, don't prosperities use, prosperity preachers use this as pretext, right? Matthew 17, verse 18, Jesus rebuked the demon. Uh, just to give you a little context here, Jesus had been up on the Mount of Transfiguration 
Peter, James, John were up there with him. He came down the mountain. This glorious moment, right? They come down, and it's almost like they go down into the depths of hell because they come down, and the other disciples, the other nine disciples are down there trying to cast a demon out, and they can't. And so there's this crazy boy. He's foaming at the mouth and falling around. And they're trying to cast a demon out. They can't. Jesus comes down from the mountain... He rebukes the demon, it came out of him, and the boy was healed instantly. And the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast, out, cast it out? He said to them, Because of your little faith. For truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move. Stop right there. That phrase, little faith, it says, because of your little faith. That phrase, little faith, in the original, it's one word. It can indeed mean small or diminutive in amount, but that would mean if it meant that in this passage, it would mean that Jesus contradicts himself because he says, if you have little faith, you can move mountains, but because of your little faith, you couldn't do this. So Jesus is not contradicting himself, and Matthew's not so stupid that he missed that Jesus contradicted himself. No. They must have understood it as something different. So that phrase, little faith, that's one word in the original, can also mean short-falling or insufficient faith. Or you could even say hypocritical faith. And I think that's, what, that's why Jesus puts this in our passage today and reminds them of what He said. This is talking about a hypocritical faith. It's the kind of false faith like the false teachers had. It was uninformed. It, refused to take truth and knowledge. It was broad. It was not self-denying, sacrificial truth. It did not take into account the truth of Scripture, the identity of Jesus. Rather, it was just sort of generic spirituality for the sake of spirituality. It was almost like those, those nine disciples who were left down there and said to themselves, hey, you know, Jesus did a trick like this one time. He can get those demons to come right out. I, I think we can do the same trick, right? That's the kind of faith Jesus means by little faith. In fact, some translations actually don't translate it as little faith. They translate it as what? Unbelief. That gives a little more light on what this means. Unbelief posing hypocritically as though they believed in Jesus, as they were doing the work of God. And yet this faith, faith was shortcoming, it was false, it was hypocritical. Of course, this contrasts genuine faith. A faith that's informed, that is rightly aimed at Jesus, it's not aimed at personal gain. It's not faith in man, it's not faith in history, it's not faith in miracles. It is a rightly aimed faith. Genuine faith has a calm assurance of His power, God's power over all, no matter what the outcome may be. It is surrendering under the sovereign will of God. It is saying, not my will, but your will be done. It's saying, I believe, help me in my unbelief. Grant me more faith. Now, that wasn't the faith the disciples had back there in 17. They had a false faith. They had a hypocritical faith that was posing as something righteous and religious, but it was false. One commentator said of this passage, this is the difference between poor faith, which is not faith at all, and actual faith, which is enough to move mountains. Those nine disciples had that poor, hypocritical faith, which is not faith at all, not genuine. It was unbelief. It was faithlessness. It was hoping in a trick, not hoping in Christ. Genuine, genuine faith is aimed at Christ, not circumstances. It's trusting God's sovereign plan, not in, not in your desired outcome. It's faith in God's goodness. It's not trying to get what you want out of God. That's genuine faith. And that's what the disciples lacked that day back in 17. So if you have faulty faith, what Jesus called little faith, hypocritical faith, you get nothing. But if you have genuine faith, if you really believe in the goodness of God, if you really believe in His power, His sovereign rule over everything, His ordinance of everything in history, if you have faith in His Son, Jesus Christ, even if that faith is as small as a mustard seed, mountains will be moved. Like I said, little faith, faulty faith, hypocritical faith, praise Lord, my will be done. True faith, even if it's small, praise Lord, your will be done. 
This certainly doesn't mean we can't beg God for uh, physical blessing, for healing, or any other physical blessing, but it means we ask this, ask this knowing that God is in control and we trust Him for whatever His answer is. And even if we die lonely and in poverty and sick, that God is with us all the way to the end, and we still believe. In contrast to hypocritical faith, this is real faith. So the faith to move mountains, both here in 17 and back in 21, which we're studying today, obviously that's not talking about physical mountains. That would be meaningless in terms of the kingdom. Clearly, this is an analogy. Analogy for what? Simply that amazing things can happen for those who have true faith. Obviously, the first thing that happens of those who generally reach out in faith is that they're saved. They are declared justified before God. There are things that do happen physically in our physical world. History is replete with stories of that kind of faith where they trusted God no matter what, and yet God blessed them in a physical way, perhaps with money or healing or whatever. But those of true faith, not hypocritical faith, those of true faith are more interested in the amazing spiritual thing that God is doing in terms of building His kingdom, saving souls, calling people to Himself, refining and maturing believers. Those things are far more amazing to someone who has faith than personal prosperity. Those are the mountains that God is constantly moving as a part of His plan to build His kingdom So that's encouraging for those of us who are true believers. Jesus is saying if you flee that hypocritical faith and you embrace genuine faith, which is true faith, it's not unbelief, posing as belief, if you do that, if you run to Christ, your your whole world changes. You start to see all these mountains, all these things that God is doing in terms of changing hearts and building His kingdom and doing what... One of the reasons I'm so excited about this missions conference is we get to hear how God's kingdom is growing and growing in spite of all the ridiculousness that's happening right now across the world. God's kingdom continues to grow. God's kingdom continues to expand. And those who are faithful, no matter what their personal circumstances are, they rejoice in the mountains that are constantly being moved for the sake of the kingdom. And Jesus is saying, you put yourself in that flow and you begin to see what I'm doing. You begin to pray for the things that I will and you see these mountains move. So in contrast to hypocrites, believers, we are to be encouraged. Jesus is giving His men encouragement, encouraging them to, uh, toward genuine faith, away from that hypocr- hypocrisy that we saw Him curse there in the first part. Ultimately, the reason we have faith is because of the person of Jesus Christ, and that's true for hypocrites, it applies to hypocrites, and it applies to believers. The reason we should, hypocrites, the reason you should tremble is because of who Christ is. Believers, the reason you're encouraged is because of who Christ is. Well, who is Jesus? Well, point three, Jesus is judge. All three of my points can actually be read as one sentence. Hypocrites, be warned, semicolon. Believers, be encouraged, semicolon, because Jesus is judge. In this passage, Jesus positions Himself not just as the immediate preacher, truth-teller, prophet. He positions Himself as the Messiah who is judge over the false religion. Not just someone who calls out false religion, but who also has the ability and the authority to judge false religion. By the way, his curse was proven true, right? How long did Judaism with the temple last? Not very long, maybe 40 more years. The kind of Judaism we have today, by the way, if you look into especially the more Orthodox and Hasidic Jews, what you find out is they are direct descendants of this type of Judaism. This hypocrisy is still there, but they cannot even worship up on the Temple Mount. They're banned from there, the Arabs... The Muslims are up there. The curse came upon them and destroyed that religion. Judaism wavered throughout the Old Testament. You've read the Old Testament, right? And throughout the Old Testament, it wavers, goes 
sort of in between something a little more faithful and a little less faithful. It goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth throughout the Old Testament. But once Jesus was on the scene and they rejected Him and He cursed them, Judaism has never returned. Yes, there are Jews who have been saved, of course, Messianic Jews. But Judaism as a whole is under a curse. Paul used the analogy of branches on a tree. He said they're broken off because of their unbelief, Romans 11, 20. Of course, most of us believe that God will do a work in the Jews' hearts toward the end, bring many back, regraft them back into the tree. But the idea of Jesus as judge, if you're a hypocrite, should cause you great fear. He can say the word. He has the power and authority to judge you eternally. If He were to withhold His mercy from you this very moment, you would stop breathing. Every breath is a kindness of God. You would fall dead without His mercy. In His kindness, He continues to give you mercy. The question is whether or not you're going to see that kindness that should lead you to repentance. If it doesn't, He'll do the same to you that He did to that tree and to the Jewish leaders and religion of that day. For believers, the idea of Jesus as judge warms the hackles of our heart because we look at this horrible world, we look at the philosophies, we look at the mentalities and the chaos and the sin and this fallen, broken world. We see it in our own society, continue to, to slide into irreparable sin and doom. We look around, we cry out for justice, for truth, for righteousness, but we do this with a twinkle in our eye because we know that one day Jesus will set all things right. He will come with myriads of angels and saints and He will bring all to justice. Let me admit something. Sometimes I get a little depressed about our society, our country. I believe our country was a fantastic experiment, a fantastic start, even marking those great awakenings that happened early in our country's history. Sure, there was plenty of sin. There were plenty of dark moments and the way we treated people and did things. I'm sure there's plenty of sin involved, but as a concept, this you know, tripartite division of checks and balances of legislative and judicial and executive branches, and it really has created the most powerful country the earth has ever seen. Now as we, as a country, flounder and flail around and continue to see the rejection of truth and moral standards, I do confess I get a little depressed, but that sadness in my heart doesn't last long. Because my hope is not on a republic or an electoral vote or some sort of act or judge or president or some congressional bill. My hope is in Jesus Christ who will come, come one day and He will reign as the absolute monarch and set everything right. So for us, we see Jesus as judge and we're encouraged. We get a little glimmer of the justice and the righteousness that He will one day bring. Let's pray. Father, we thank You so much for the wonderful story of the cursing of the fig tree. And it does encourage those of us who are believers trying not to be hypocritical about our faith, trying to abandon that, abandon that kind of hypocrisy, trying to be genuine and have genuine faith and aim our faith at Christ alone. Lord, we thank You for that desire that You've placed in our hearts to do just that. And Lord, I pray for those who are here or maybe watching or listening who are true hypocrites, open their eyes to their own hypocrisy. They go around proclaiming their faith and their belief and their righteousness, and yet they don't even trust in Jesus. So I pray, Lord, that you would break their hearts, open up their minds and hearts to what Christ has accomplished in his life and death and resurrection. Grant them the faith to believe in Him and to repent of their sin and turn to Him. We all would ask for your strength in this, Lord. We ask for it in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, stand with me for a benediction. This is inspired by 1 Thessalonians 5, 2 to 11 that we heard earlier. Now may we go with the magnificent encouragement that God has not destined us for wrath, but for life eternal with His Son by the power of the Spirit. Amen.